Sometimes the truth isn't good enough, you know? Sometimes people deserve more. Sometimes people deserve to have their faith rewarded. So it's time to go beyond. It's time. Black man, going beyond all the time. Tell your friends, tell your mom. That this pod is the bomb. It's the black man. Yep, the star of the show. Staying humble, but sometimes you just gotta let them know. It's the black man. Oh, yes, the black man. Hello. How are you guys doing? We're on a fucking boat, right? <clears throat> I, uh, I, this is my first ever cruise. You too? So I'm, uh, I'm feeling a certain way. Um, it's not bad at all. I feel, you know, they've been, what, what's up? What did you say? Yes, more drinks. Um, they're taking very good care of us so far. Um, but I'm super excited to talk to you guys tonight. I have a guest who I met once. I'm not sure if he remembers meeting me, but that's fine. Most people don't. Um, we had done a convention. I think it was New York Comic Con, or maybe it was Emerald City. And I, Sci-Fi Channel had paid me money to talk to people for like eight-minute clips. And they were like, we got this nerdcore rapper named Mega Ran. And I was like, oh, shit. I've never heard of him before. But then I did some research and listened to his music and then became an instant fan. And then when I found out he was on this cruise, I was like, oh, yo, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to take one of the other eight black dudes on this boat and talk to him for an hour in front of all of you lovely people. So put your hands together for Mega Ray! Hey! Dude, I just met the ninth black man. He's backstage. What? Hey. Oh, shit. I counted two. I counted two. My wife says 12, but she's being generous. Hey, uh, hey, you. Yes, go. All right. All right, excellent. So, uh, so I feel like the numbers are on our side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Totally. Boys and girls, we're going to have a good time tonight. Um, mm -hmm. My quest for these are always less, I'm going to interview him, and more, we're going to try and find a way to get into a conversation, mm -hmm. because uh, I'm not a journalist anymore, so I don't have to do this the right way. Ah. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a traveling salesman of interviews. There you go. There like it that. is. So, uh, so listen, how are you doing? Ah, doing amazing. This cruise already has been so cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm ready for a good time this weekend. Yeah. I met Kevin Smith today. <gasps> what? Yes. So much fun. <laughs> um, you were just in Morocco, right? Uh, yes, yes. Anybody ever been to Morocco? Nope. No, oh. right? Who the fuck gets to go to Morocco? Nobody, right? Nobody. Um, <laughs> were you in Casablanca, the only city I know in Morocco? I was in Casablanca. Um, All right. Biggest city out there. Really cool. They have a Rick's Cafe. Uh, I found out that the movie Casablanca was not shot there. No. It was shot in Burbank. Mm -hmm. um, they were never there. There were no Moroccans involved in the production. <laughs> and I'm like, damn. <laughs> but you know, not surprising, I guess. But uh, yeah. yeah Hollywood in the 40s was not about representation or inclusion in any way. Nah. Not even a little bit. Dude, I don't even, I, as you were saying it, I was like, oh, wow, we did meet. We totally met. <laughs> and um, it took a minute. <laughs> But yes, the uh, New York Comic Con mm -hmm. with Sci-Fi. Wow, that was that was amazing. It was so long ago, but uh, yeah, it came to me like as you were saying it. I was like, oh, we have met. Okay, that's my effect on people. <laughs> 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 they remember me once I remind them <laughs> they've met me. <laughs> um, but no, it was also a weird thing because Sci-Fi. Because um, I used to do a podcast for Sci-Fi called the Battlestar Galacticast. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Y'all are too sweet. And, uh, and so they're like, hey, you can talk to people good. Do you want to do that for us live in front of people? <laughs> and I said, how much are you going to pay me? Mm. Um, and they said, not much. We're sci-fi. And I said, that's enough. I'm a cheaper <laughs> date than you thought. <laughs> and, uh, and so they were just like, I would have the schedule from like 9 to 5. Who's going to be on the couch? Who do we have to talk to? Mm. And sometimes it could be people that I like knew and loved. Like I got to, like Neil Gaiman was on the stage once with nice. the Good Omens cast, and I've known Neil for a while, so to get to like talk to him for real was nice. And then there's like... Me. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this? 
all right, how much time before? Okay, I'll, I'll get on Wikipedia real quick and see who's who and what's what. Yeah. Um, and then the job is just not looking like an ass, which I did anyway, <laughs> and that's fine. My payment from uh, Sci-Fi that weekend was I got to go to the Sci-Fi studios and uh, shoot some podcast stuff, which is the NBC studio. 30 Rock. It's 30 Rock. So I got to go inside as a huge 30 Rock fan, a huge fan of Jimmy Fallon, The Roots. I got to walk by Questlove's like, door. I was like, as a Philly guy, I was like, this is amazing. I'm just like, please let me run into Questlove. <laughs> like, I just walked by the office like six times like to the bathroom and did not run into him. But that was enough payment for me, like just to be like there where the magic happens. Like I think there was a tour happening where people were going onto the stage for the Tonight Show, and all that. So that was really cool. I've been to Thirty Rock twice. Um, the I'll tell you about the second time first. The second time I was going to see Conan O'Brien when he was doing the Late Late Show before he got the Tonight Show, and then before they kicked him off of network television. Hmm. Um, but I was going with my my wife and my, one of my best friends, who was a private investigator. Where, uh, yeah, like for real, like oh. a dude who investigates private shit. Wow. And, uh, and so we're going, and if you know anything about 30 Rock, and especially going to see a live show, there's like nine layers of security. There's like the ground floor security, then you're going up to the studio level security, then there's another thing of security, and they're walking up to a metal detector that we see like, you know, 100 people ahead of us. And he goes, Mark, I have my private investigator kit on me. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean, Nick? And he's like... I'm carrying. Oh. It's like, why are you carrying? Why? We're going to see Conan fucking O'Brien. Did you think you need to be strapped? Never know. Against redheads? Like, what, what's the problem? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bitter Gosh. gingers. Y'all are fucked up. Wow. They have no soul. That feels like some ginger nonsense. Um. Oh, well, I believe Mythbusters. <laughs> like, I feel like if there's like 11 black dudes on this boat, I feel like the dozen gingers would also get together and be sure that they don't start fucking with you. Like, how's, how's your pain tolerance? Anyway, Nick is carrying a gun as we're going into the fucking late show. Wow. And, uh, and he's like, it's, it'll, it, all right. I'm like, all right, so do I need to come up with a cover for why you're having a gun? He's like, yeah, we'll just say that I'm on the job, that I'm your bodyguard. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. And then I start inventing like this very elaborate backstory for why I need a bodyguard. And so I'm like, all right, am I a rapper? No, I don't look like a rapper. I can't pull that off. <laughs> you could be a rapper. I mean, this, this, this would have been like mid-2000s, early 2000s. I didn't have the chains for it. No chains. Ah. I, didn't the, I didn't have the sneakers for it. No, like, no I was Timberlands. Just, Not even any Timberlands? Ah. I, was, I, was as, I was like one step more hip than Carlton. So was never passing off rapper. So then I was like, all right, all right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell him that I'm like a, a Nigerian prince. I went straight to fucking you African went royalty. Straight, I went straight to, to like, Zamunda. I'm going to be a fucking Zamunda. Yeah. I mean, if you can be anything, be an African prince. Be an African prince. I and get so, it. So I I'm like it. working it in my head. is like, you know, figuring out what I'm going to say. I come from the place with that, dude. And, uh, <laughs> and so we get up to the, the metal detector, because, of course, he's got his fucking PI kit on him. And he, he turns to the guard and he goes, hey, I'm on the job. The guard goes, okay, just walk around here. I was like, oh, I have man. a fucking backstory and everything. Um, I, was, I had I forged papers in my off time. I had everything. He's like, motherfucker. He's like, yes, it's okay. I just told him I was on the job. I was so crestfallen. You didn't get to use anything? I didn't get to use like, anything. I am very happy to be here. Yes. Something, you know, coming to America. Umele, like, umele. You could have pulled something out. Very much so. Uh, the first time that I went, I, uh, I went to go see Saturday Night Live. Um, I was an Entertainment Weekly editor, and I rarely flexed any of that. Like, EW in like the late 90s, early 2000s was like a pretty big deal. Oh, yeah. I never got to take advantage of it because I'm not that guy, except when I wanted to go see SNL. So yeah. I started like calling up all of the, the contacts I had, the TV editors, the editor of the magazines. Like, yeah, I want to go to SNL. Like, okay, when do you want to go? I want to go this date. Do you want to go for the dress rehearsal or for the actual live production? Because they, they let you into both. There's a full audience for the dress rehearsal oh, wow. where you'll see more skits. There's a half an hour more show because then they cut shit. Yeah. And then you can go to the live show and that's a live show. Go to the fucking live show. Why don't I do that? Mm -hmm. So it was Christina Aguilera was the musical guest mm -hmm. and Christopher Walken was the host. 
Oh my god. And it was the cowbell. You got the cowbell episode. I was, I was I was in the house for fucking cowbell. I see why you did the second story first. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. All right. And like I remember like Five or six years ago, there had been some wave of the internet where a bunch of children discovered that there's a history before them. Who were like, is Cowbell really that funny? Yes. And I was like, yes, bitch, because I was there and I couldn't breathe for five minutes. <laughs> I was It is there. the funniest thing I've ever seen in person. Um, so go home, child. You don't know what you're talking about. So that's my 30 Rock experience. You didn't wow. see Quest Love, but I got to mine. see Cowbell. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. It's not bad. <laughs> um, speaking of Philly, um, I, I feel like we should we should introduce the people who don't know who you are okay. to you. All right. So you're a Philly kid. I'm a Philly kid, born and raised, not West Philadelphia. A lot of people feel like that is... Um, is that a bad part of town, really? Yeah, I was not allowed to go there. It absolutely. It's a bad part of town. North Philly. Ah, I'm from North, so that's... It. I guess I'm a little bit biased because, <laughs> you know, I grew up kind of in the North side. Northwest is actually where I grew up. Uh, Part of town called West Oak Lane. Um, sounds all nice and dainty. Um, and earlier in probably the 70s and 80s is where a lot of like middle class blacks would eventually kind of migrate to when they were trying to get out of the rough parts, south and west. Um, and then later they were kind of pushed out even further. So uh, so now it's it's a little rough up there. But um, <laughs> we wanted to give it a cool name, so they started calling it Uptown. Like, yeah, this well. is Uptown. You know, but it wasn't it wasn't cool at all. No, you couldn't help it. Even Uptown no. wasn't doing it. No, no, because we were like considered like the rich kids of Philly. So because we were like just on the outskirts, but had a Philadelphia dress, which is good enough for me. But you know, when I would go to school, um, and they're like, "Well, you barely live in the city. You're not like in South Philly or downtown." But um, but yeah, it was a it's a good place to grow up. I think like I got a lot of my inspirations from there. We were like the nerd kids on the block. Like that was. Pretty much what it was. It was a block full of kind of hoodlums, you know, but and I had you. four or five nerdy kids with me that would encourage me. We would we would draw. We would play video games all the time. Uh, we would tinker with our bike parts, take them apart, put them together, make new things happen. You know, it was um, we would put cans on the back tire of the bike so we could go and it sounded like a dirt bike. It was a lot of fun. But um, yeah, we were just the nerd kids. So they would be like, there's the nerds. You know, that was us. Did you ever, I think, I feel like we're about six or seven years apart um, in age. I was born in 71. You were born in, what, like 77? 77, yeah. um, Was Megaforce a thing when you were a kid? No. What's Megaforce? Do you guys know what Megaforce is? Megaforce is one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> unless you were seven years old yeah, when it came Unless you were out. there. Unless you were, like, the right age for it. It's a movie where... There's an international strike force of dudes in lycra suits who ride dirt bikes and dune buggies into like solve crimes on an international terrorist scale. It's the dumbest fucking thing you've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it was directed by Hal Needham, who was a stuntman who then went on to Smoking the Bandit and Cannonball Run. So like all of the car shit is super cool. But okay. they had this thing where they would be riding these these dirt bikes, and their missiles would fire from the handlebars of the dirt bikes. Oh, this sounds awesome. It's great. It was on the back of every comic book for like four years. And it was Barry Bostwick, who would then become the mayor of whatever in Spin City. Mm. Um, yeah, you know fucking Barry Bostwick, right? Uh, with this gorgeous mane of hair. Like the most beautiful hair you've ever seen. Persis Kambata with all of her actual hair. She, had, she didn't shave it off yet for Star Trek The Motion Picture. Okay. And then a bunch of other guys who might have been cowboys or might have just been gay. Unclear. <laughs> Um, but the hair was gorgeous. Like they all had like, yeah. the feathered Farrah Fawcett hair. Oh, yeah. But they're all in, like skin tight lycra, and they had like the lightning bolts on their uniforms. And the credo was "deeds, not words," mm. and it was in the back of every comic book. Anyway, when I was a kid growing up, and that was the fucking jam, and I saw that movie, I would take bottle rockets to the rim of my handlebars on my oh, dirt bike, yeah. and like try to pop wheelies and shoot things in the nice, sky. Nice, nice. Okay, that's awesome. It went. As badly as you can imagine, it went. <laughs> because it turns out that when you tape a bottle rocket, it doesn't actually go anywhere. No, no. it just stays where it is <laughs> and explodes. Then it, yeah, just <laughs> yeah. So there's <laughs> lots of like, this is cool, <laughs> and then like Terrified. hands are like all the hair is burned <laughs> off your hands, and um, so yeah, that was Mega that Force. was that was my growing up rough in the hood. All right, okay, in the Bronx. Um, Megaforce. Also, as the like one of the two or three brown nerds in you know the Bronx. Yeah. 
Um, what was your what was your nerd vector? What was your thing? What was your jam as a kid? Oh man, there were so many things. I feel like the '80s. We were just so blessed. Like just so much good stuff came at a, at the at the same time. Um, you know, it was Thundercats. There was He Man. There was Ninja Turtles. There was GI Joe was my jam for sure. Like I love Joes. You know, and so we'd buy a bunch of them, and then we would create. Like with cardboard, we would make new vehicles for them. We would figure out new ways to come up with jets and tanks for them, for these Joes, and we put them everywhere. And then I started doing, figuring out how to switch the the bodies with the legs, you know, the torso. We'd do a little weird trick to get the, uh, you know, the thing. I'm sure some folks are like, "What is he talking about?" But yeah, we and would. Some um, folks are like, "Yeah, I know did exactly that what yeah. he's talking Storm about." Storm Shadow, I would mix with Snake Eyes, and then come up with a whole new character. You know, so um, yeah, Joes were my thing. Transformers, of course, too. Um, yeah, I was, you know, just wrapped up in the '80s for sure. And I had this recording device called the Kid Quarter. It was this uh, GE bright yellow tape recorder, and I would sit it next to the television set and hit play and record, and I would record the theme songs of all my favorite shows. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, there was anything with a robot or you know some sort of tech. Does anybody remember um, Mighty Orbots? This was um, one of the, I think it was a Saturday morning show, stuff like that. So anything cool with a with a weird '80s go and team and bam bam, you know, like anything like that. Team <clears throat> America, fuck yeah, yes, basically, so they, yeah, basically. And I'd record them one after the other on this uh, on this cassette, and then on the other side, I would, my Nintendo games, like any game I was playing, I would record the the songs from the Nintendo games. It was Mario. It was. Duck Hunt, it was Mega Man, it was DuckTales, like any video games or cartoons that I found, I uh, would record them on both sides of these tapes. And then um, later, uh, when Yo! MTV Raps would became the thing, rap music hit like around the same time as video game music for me. And so then it was one side of the tape was Nintendo and the other side was hip hop. And so, thank goodness that my Walkman had auto reverse. So, like, if the bullies are like, "What are you listening to, nerd?" I could flip it really quick and be like, "Oh, Beastie Boys, cool," you know. <laughs> and then I'd flip it back, and it was Sonic the Hedgehog, you know. And like, <laughs> nice. so yeah, one side was always video games, the other side was hip hop. Like, they hit me at the exact same time. And ironically, it just it took me 20 years later to realize, like, huh. Maybe as an adult, now that I know something about both of these worlds, I can combine them and figure out what to do. So that was where the name like Mega Ran came. Like a G.I. Joe figure. Yes. Look what Look we at did that. there. Look at that. That was beautiful. Um, so what, what did your parents think of, of, of this young kid who was, again, in the northwest Philadelphia yeah. as the nerd kid who's playing with G.I. Joes and listening to video game themes? Like, Were your parents chill with it? Were they like... No, we're not having this in this house. Uh, they were good with it until maybe, I guess, high school, mid college for sure. They were like, all right, you got to throw these things away. You got to stop. Like, And so, yeah, I went away to college and my comic book collection, my garbage bail kids, my Marvel cards, <laughs> my figures were just feel gone. The, feel the hurt. I the came home for, like for spring break. I'm like, uh, mom, what happened to... My stuff. She's like, ah, you know, the kids on the block, you know, they could use that stuff a little more than you. You're, you're a college boy now. And I was like, ah, oh, man. And so, yeah, that was when it was time for me to grow up, quote unquote. You know, it was like, all right, you got to leave this stuff behind eventually. Um, because that was the whole thing. Like, you're not going to make a living doing this. Like, video games aren't going to pay the bills and all these things aren't going to, you know. And I'm like, well, somebody makes these things and they get paid a lot of money to do it, you know, but we just, that was just so far out of the, the realm of possibility. Like someone writes these comic books and gets paid for it, you know, like that was just not uh, anything that we could comprehend at that time. So, you know, fast forward and we what get to was do with what we parents like just throwing shit away. Like, you'd yeah. think the parents, especially of my generation, your generation, you know, parents who were not of, like, an immense means, would throw away shit that they paid for. <laughs> yeah. Like, when do they do that? Like, what do they have against comic books that they're like, this has to go. We have to burn this shit in effigy to make sure that he never reads yeah, it again. I don't, I don't get it. Like, these are the things that, you know, they, yeah, you already bought them. Like, they're they're... What, I guess they're taking up too much space? I don't, I don't, I don't know. They left my Playboys alone. Like, 
the fuck is this stack of nudie magazines you're fine with, but the comic books have to go. They're polluting your mind. <sighs> yeah, I don't get it. That's, that's a strange thing. Like, I don't, I never understood that. You know, I'll, I'll make sure to never do that with my kid. You didn't do that with your kid, right? Um, no, because my kid wasn't a nerd. Oh. It happens. It skips a generation. I'm sorry. Like, get uh, ready, motherfuckers, to oh, have, like, man. the jock son or daughter uh, to be like, what are you doing? It's like another Marvel movie. Haven't they made enough of these already? <laughs> like, <laughs> like no. how did I do this? What did I do wrong? Uh, what did I raise? My kid now, yeah, I mean, he's only two, but I'll be like, hey, you want to play a video game? No. And I'm like, oh, man, you'll yeah. get there. You'll get there. Like, they'll come to it on their own. Like, mm. I remember my son, I tried to get him to watch Star Wars. Like, I tried so fucking hard. Mm. A New Hope, sorry, to the to that ah. particular generation. <laughs> um, it'll always be Star Wars to me. Yes. But, um, like, and so he's like four or five years old, and I'm like, come on, buddy, it's time. Let's fucking do it. Let's sit down. Yeah. And he got like 20 minutes in, and was like, I'm bored. It's like, how could you be bored? It's the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> I'm bored. And then I'd like bribe him with French fries to like watch it. <laughs> And then, but like we run out of French fries, and then you'd still be on fucking Tatooine chasing down crate dragons, uh, and you haven't met Luke yet. Because oh. remember, guys, it's 25 minutes before you meet Luke Skywalker in That's A New true. Hope. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not digging on these droids. I'm like, I know, buddy, just give it some, give it some time. Wait, just wait. And he wouldn't wait. And then he starts playing like Angry Birds Star Wars edition. Huh. And then he's like, Dad, did you know that Han Solo and Chewbacca are best friends? He says, Yeah, buddy. But tell me more about this Star Wars <laughs> that you more. love so much. Tell me more. Tell me more. Um, <laughs> and okay, so that's your nerd shit. What about your your music stuff? What what was what was tickling the ganglia when you were a kid? I don't oh, know. Man. Is that a thing? That's Anybody a, a doctor in the in the house? No, that sounds ganglia sounds right. Is that good? Basal yeah. ganglia, yeah. sure. It's spicy. Yeah, I love to tinker. So anything that was like electronic you know, related, I could just mess with. So we, um, I guess one summer, one of my friends brought a, a four track recorder to the, to the, sh to the block. And we we're like, how does this work? You know? And he's like, ah, you know, just hit these buttons and plug up a microphone and you can just like hear yourself sing and then you can play it back on the cassette. And we're like, oh, that's so cool. So we would just work on that and record our little songs. And it was just, just kind of covering whatever, you know, like it was Beastie Boys, Run DMC, it was uh, LL Cool J, it was like, I'm bad, you know, and then we would just try to sing every word and write it down. De La Soul, uh, me, myself, and I, we'd write down all the lyrics, put it up on our mirror, and then just like rehearse it and rehearse it, and then, you know, grab the hairbrush and, you know, go to town. And uh, then we could actually record ourselves doing it. And uh, so from there it became, and again it was video games. Um, there's a video game called MTV Music Generator, which uh, came out in early 2000s, and you could uh, make your own beats. And I'm like, ah, oh, cool, cool. So I got this thing and I put it in, and all you could make was like techno drum and bass. <laughs> and I'm like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. We did it, so, you guys. Thanks for coming. Making beats. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> beats 101. Beats 101. Um, so, yeah, we, I, I couldn't figure it out. It's like, I can't get hip-hop to work on this. This is, nah. You know? And then I found out that you could sample. And I'm like, wait a minute. So there was a, a mode where you could eject the game from the PlayStation, put in any other disc, and then you could just sample from that and get about 10 seconds of sample time. And you could use that to make a beat and then put the disc back in and start chopping and, you know. And, and uh, nobody came after MTV for this? No. I mean, they, they stopped making it pretty quickly. But, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, maybe it didn't We're last. We're letting them steal music? We're letting them steal. So I didn't have a bunch of CDs, so I started going to my local library. So I got my library card renewed and was like grabbing stacks of CDs to come in out of the library. Like, yeah, I'm going to sample this. And all they had was like classical. So I'm like, oh, yeah, Vivaldi, you're mine. <laughs> Let's go. And so I would take a bunch of classical and then make hip hop beats out of it. And my mom would be walking by while I do it. And she's like, you're going to get sued. <laughs> she's like, you know, again, with parents just being like, don't do that thing. You know, <laughs> it was, that's a lot of that in my story where my mom's like, no, you can't do that. You know, like I'll get the Motown greatest hits and take some Stevie Wonder. And like that drum from Stevie on Superstition that plays at the beginning. So now I can take that and go. And now I have a new beat based on that. And my mom's like, 
yeah, you can't do that, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah, I can. Pete Diddy does it all the time, you know? And um, she's like, yeah, but he has money, you know? So we were uh, just sampling everything I could find and making beats out of them. So I'd be like, okay, drums from Stevie, uh, melody from Michael Jackson, uh, you know, strings from Vivaldi. And next thing you know, I had this weird song. And, uh, and then I started getting video game soundtracks. And I'm like, oh, Resident Evil's got some bangers. Final Fantasy's got some bangers. And then we started sampling that into the music. And um, next thing you know, I got beats. And well, like Wu-Tang Clan was huge at this time. So I was like, I'm kind of like the RZA, you know? Like I'm, the, I'm totally the RZA here, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, my name started with R. So I was like, yeah, I'm the RZA of the block. And, um, and so I started making beats for my friends to rap on. And then I would secretly start writing my own raps. Like, and I'd be like, hey, I got a rap. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm like, I got a rap. I'm like, no, you don't. Let me hear it. And then I would rap a little bit. And they're like, nah, you don't have no, a rap. You don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so my friends were so good. Like, they, you know, just so really good at, like, technique and, like, just putting all of our high school vocabulary words into their raps. And I was like, that's so cool. And, uh, and I just wanted to be as good as my friends. So I would, every night, I bought my own four track and I made my own beats. And I would come back every day and like, hey, I got a tape. And they're like, a whole tape? I'm like, yeah, yeah, a whole tape. And they're like, it's not that good. And then t a week later, hey, I got another tape. <laughs> like, I would make whole albums in my house in, the, in a week, just writing so much because I just wanted to be as cool as those guys. And they, they were like, mm, your stuff's a little too nerdy. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you started off saying, like, you Hadouken MCs or Sonic Boom them or you make them retreat like Cobra Commander. Like, we... No one's going to get that stuff, you know? And they were like instantly kind of taught me out of the nerd record. Where are all the bitches and hoes, please? <laughs> no hoes, like no a guns. Cap in someone's jimmy? No? <laughs> Too much Zero nerd hoes <laughs> in your whole rap tape? And uh, yeah, they were kind of talking me out of like, these nerd references aren't going to work. And, and so that kind of discouraged me, but I was like, maybe I need to find my audience and it's not these guys. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, I just kind of kept going. And thank God, I, I found an audience of nerds that were, were just like me. And they're like, dude, Final Fantasy changed my life, too, you know, and things like that. And man, I love Sonic the Hedgehog, too. And, you know, so finding those kids that were just like me, like maybe the, the kids from the hood who were just really nerdy or the kids, you know, the black kids who were told, stop doing that white shit, you know, and things like that. And I feel like... <laughs> You are with me. We're we're we're, we're one, and uh, and that's that. That was you know it became kind of my audience, and it's like became my thing, and um, you know that yeah it was a weird thing, but it was like everyone telling me not to do it is kind of what made me want to do it, which was weird. And you were also like because yeah you grew up in in Northwest Philly, love nerd shit whatever, and then when you got to be a real adult person, you were a teacher, yeah. Yes, correct. What ages did you teach? Oh, I taught middle school, which is like the worst. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I deserve I'm sorry. applause for that. I did five years. I did a bid. <laughs> man, thank you. Five years is yeah, that's a lot. Um, I taught in Philadelphia, and then I moved to Phoenix, and um, and taught in Phoenix uh, middle school. So sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and um, because when I graduated school, they were like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I got out of college with um, an African American studies degree. Good and luck. they were like, um, so what do you want to do with that? And I was like, I don't know. What can I do with that? And they were like, well, here's the list. And it was two things. They were like, um, you can be like, uh, you can run a museum. <laughs> <laughs> that nobody will go to. Or you can teach. And I was like, I'll, I'll try to teach. And they were like, good, because we have an overwhelming need for middle school teachers that are male. And I was like, okay, but I'm doing it. And I got in there, and it was rough. Um, I'm in uh, North Philadelphia, a school called Roberto Clemente Middle School. Um, high uh, Hispanic population. And um, the day before I got there, they, the, the school was on the news because an ecstasy ring had just gotten broken up at the school, at middle school. I mean, no, kids selling to the teachers. Seventh graders do not fuck around. Like, it was wild. Uh, and they were like, Yo, you Miss know. Yo, Miss Carter, you want some of this good good? I got it right here for you. <laughs> insane like 
It was it was lean on me. Like I was that was where I was. I was you were, you, were, you were, it was less Abbott Elementary and more lean on me. Uh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> because Abbott Elementary makes it seem like Philly's got great schools and teachers who care and these kids oh, are adorable. God. I love Abbott Elementary, but man. And Not almost that. it gets a it's almost a little triggering for me. Like I love that show. <laughs> But like, like I baby, see what's the matter? Why are you writhing on the ground? And I'm just Fucking like, uh, flashbacks are coming back. You're like budget cuts. Oh man. Oh, you know, like the little things that I had to deal with in school, like coming to school and like kids don't have pencils, kids don't have whatever they need. And I'm like, no problem. I'll just buy it, you know. And they're like, we'll, we'll reimburse you. And then you get to the end of the school year. Well, what had happened was our funding <laughs> went somewhere else. So we're not reimbursing you for anything. But good luck. Um, they were like, so here's your code for the copier. And I'm like, oh, code for the copier? What do you mean? They're like, yeah, because you can only print 50 pages per school year. <laughs> per so, year? Per year, yeah. Outside of that, you got to figure something else out. Like, you only have access to 50 pages of print for the school year. Did you I'm have like, to, like, do illuminated manuscripts yourself? Did you have to, like, hand copy shit because you couldn't? Uh, oh, wow. yeah. I started getting creative. We're like, all right, we're doing, we're doing four on one piece of paper. We're doing squares. We're going to fold. <laughs> <laughs> rip them mini tests and they're like another mini test mr j like yep um you know we had to just come up with whatever we could and um had to learn the the fine art of not teaching to the test by teaching to the test and i'm like what are you talking about they're like yeah so we can't teach them how to take the you know state tests but here's how to teach them how to take the test <laughs> it's like wait what is happening uh, because of a um, an act that passed the uh, No Child Left Behind, everybody's like, we got to get these kids through, you know? And if we don't, there's a direct, uh, you know, effect, and it's going to affect the amount of resources we get next year. If you don't have 80% of your kids passing, we don't get new books. <laughs> you get 40 pages next year. Yeah, it's going to be bad. So they would be like, you, so, but you can't teach to the test. But here's how. And they would just give us these weird things on how to, you know. But it was all about teacher accountability, which I'm all for. Like, teachers need to be held accountable. But then it got to this weird micromanaging stage where they would come into my classroom and be like, you know, Mr. J, I don't see enough motivational posters on your wall. <laughs> And I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Like, oh, you know, the, like with the cat holding on to the clothesline saying, like, hang in there, baby. You know, stuff like that. We've, we've, we've been, I think that those help motivate kids. So you really need more than, you know, like, what you got? And I'm like, are you got, do we have a budget for this? Oh, no, no, you pay for this stuff. It's the things that I get reimbursed for, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So your room didn't have enough flair? Yeah, not enough saying? pieces of flair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's literally it. Uh, oh man, it was it was a lot of that, you know. And I, and I, as a musician, I would bring music to my class as much as I could. I'm like, let's play some songs, you know. And or I would uh, I'd freestyle rap with my kids. I would be like, all right, if you guys all score a certain score on the test, we're gonna we're gonna have rap freestyle Friday, you know. And everybody would um, write their like we would study our spelling words on three by five cards. And I'm like, everybody hold up a card. And then we would just be like, I flow like this water. This rhyme is a slaughter. I need a quarter, you know, something like that. And we would just have a lot of fun with with word play. And um, and one of my principals came and was like, yeah, um, I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> going to work with the <laughs> curriculum we're trying to do here. And I'm like, I'm teaching them what exactly what you want me to do. I'm just trying to trying to speak the language a little bit. You know, I do feel like hip hop is the language of the youth for sure. And um, and they didn't like that a lot of the kids were like, my teacher's a rapper. Like they were so impressed by that. But it's middle school, so nothing an adult does can be fun or impressive or good. So they would be like, nah, you know, it was all right. Whatever. I'd sit here and rap for them and they'd be like, it's all right. It's okay. My cousin raps. You know, he's probably a little better. But and then they would leave and tell their other friends, like, my teacher can rap. My teacher's a rap. He's better than your teacher. <laughs> and, uh, it sounds like yeah. this was you were doing the Lord's work. You were teaching kids with ingenuity and innovation and enthusiasm. What made you leave it all behind, <laughs> asshole? Like, we need <laughs> teachers like this. I quit. <laughs> tell them that. Uh, yeah, tell them that. Um, I. Yeah, you know, they don't pay enough. I'll just say that. Um, for the, the amount of work you have to put in, you know, and again, I'm spending half my check just putting it literally right back into the school, which I didn't mind doing. But, man, then bills are due. And you're like, wow, I'm working so hard. Like, 
you know, for eight to four day, I'm there six to six, you know, just to just to make sure everything is right. So the amount of work you put in, you know, I didn't feel like it was coming back. But at the same time, everybody doesn't always have something else to do or to fall back mm -hmm. on, you know. And so I got lucky. So at the same time, I would moonlight. I was a weekend warrior. I was doing tours. I was playing shows. I was doing all types of things. And um, I made an album about Final Fantasy that like kind of went viral on the side while I was while I was doing this. And one of my uh, one day teaching, I'm just fed up, and uh, and my phone just starts going crazy. This bloop bloop, and I forgot to put it on silent. Bloop bloop bloop, and uh, I start looking at it during one of my breaks, and my friend's like, dude. Your album is on Reddit. And this is 2011. And I was like, what the hell is Reddit? <laughs> and, um, and he's like, dude, it's like going viral. And I start reading and all these like really cool comments about the album and people were buying it and people were asking me to come out and play shows. And I played like my first PAX and Comic-Con and all these other cool things happen. And then um, MC Chris found me from that and he uh, asked me to go on tour with him. And he's like, hey man. He talks like that for yeah. real. So he's like, I was just wondering if you want to go on tour with me, man. And I was like, let me look at my, uh, let me look at my, my calendar. I was like, all right, I got this teaching thing going on where they like, they hate me, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> or a possibility to go what what 45 cities that are already sold out shows. Yeah, I'll do that. And so um, I put in my two weeks notice, and I was like, I can always come back to teaching. Like I went to my mom first and was like, all right, mom, I just want you to hear me out. I got an idea for the next month and a half, but it needs, I need to leave teaching for it. And she's like, what? Are you crazy? And I'm like, yes, but I can always teach. Like, I feel like once you get it, you got it, you know, and I can come back if this doesn't work out. And she's like, all right, well, and she gave me the best piece of advice that any mom could give. She said, don't ask me for no money. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, uh, and so that has literally been my motivation for 11 <laughs> years. It's like, I can't get so down that I have to ask my mom for money. That's why I work my ass off now. Because if I have to go back to my mom, like, so, uh, you got a honey? I need, uh, I got to You know that thing you told me not to do that I did anyway, but now I'm regretting it? <laughs> yeah. Can you Sorry. help me? I need you, need you to spot me. I just feel like I just can't, I can't go back. So now I just work really hard. And uh, so the tour went really well. Um, but my teaching, my class, my, my principal was very petty. So um, <laughs> when I told him, you know, my mom always said, don't leave a job without, you know, doing the right thing, putting a two weeks notice. I do that. And I'm like, thank you for the opportunity. If I'd had chat GPT back then, I would have chat GPT <laughs> this. But this was a really well-written letter. And I was just like, man, thanks for the opportunity. I'm going out to try to chase my dream. And you've taught me so much living, working here. And he's like, OK. And, uh, and then it was two weeks notice. So at the end of that day, he came to my classroom when I was cleaning up. And he's like, hey, uh, Mr. Jarbo. Um, I need you to fill out some outstanding paperwork. And I was like, okay, no problem. And he's like, so um, remember like a week ago when you like took a day off? Like you didn't call, like, uh, something like that. you didn't call in on time or something like that. Or maybe you didn't have any sick days when you took that day. And I was like, for real? And he's like, well, I just need you to sign that we had this conversation. And I'm like, okay, sign it off. And in the slickest of maneuvers, he like, flips the paper and moves it, and then the paper underneath is a termination letter. And he's like, yeah, basically because you signed that, yeah, you're, you're out of here. So you took oh, a day off shit. that you weren't supposed to two months ago, and uh, it just comes back on the same day that I put in a two weeks notice. And he's like, yeah, so you don't have to finish out those, those two weeks, like you, could, you can leave today. You can get an early start on chasing your dream. <laughs> and I was like, <clears throat> in my head, of course, but, um, yeah, yeah. So he like got me out of there. So I didn't get to say goodbye to my kids or anything. Oh which shit! Really that sucks. Is so sad. Yes, yeah, after school, like I would have had a bomb pizza party or something, man. Like we wouldn't have learned anything that day. Oh, man. You know? <laughs> uh, but you know, um, as I'm leaving, dejected, he's like, "Oh, but by the way, um, <clears throat> report cards are due into this week. So um, part of your like final, you know, to get your last paycheck, you must finish any." outstanding paperwork, so please bring in those report cards tomorrow morning. And I'm like, I don't work here anymore. And he's like, yeah, but you know, you got it. 
And I was like, okay. And everybody got an A. <laughs> Even my, my worst reader got an A plus. He went from a D to an A that day. Yeah. It was a miraculous turnaround. And um, so, yeah, everybody got A's. And then I just went on with the rest of my life. But um, I got the last word, I guess. I don't know. I mean. And the, all those words begin with the letter A. 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 I, you know. So that was my goodbye to them. Like, I didn't get this, you know, actually say goodbye. But I feel like, you know, those kids who were cruising by with C's were like, Mr. J, thanks, you know. I don't have to explain this to my mom, you know. <laughs> like, mom, I just want to tell you, this teacher hates me. I mean, this teacher loves me. Everything's all good, you know. And so. I know all of it now, and this will not bite me in the ass at all next year <laughs> when they lay me in honors because I got an A this year. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, did you ever, like, like, rent the Hummer, the Stretch Hummer limo and, like, you know, drive by the school what? with fucking like bottles popping out the windows. Like, oh hey, Mr. Principal, I just driving by. I don't know if things are going all right for me now. Just want to let you know. How much do you think rappers make? <laughs> listen, my entire like, especially rappers you haven't heard of. Like, let's just be honest. <laughs> like, you're all Jay Z as far as I know. <laughs> like, we're booking the Louvre to shoot music videos. That's not that's not your life. Nah, nah. nah. I, I rode by there in my Hyundai. And, um, <laughs> but still popping bottles, right? I was popping bottles, seven up, I don't know. But like, you know what's crazy? It was um, a charter school, and the school isn't even around anymore. Like, oh. it was literally rubble when I went by there like a year later. Like, the school has been closed because they, I'm sure, violated so many, like, codes, you know, by not doing the right thing. So, you know, I won that brat beef. That was, uh, that was my first taste of beef. <laughs> that uh, I want. Tell me how you describe success for yourself. How do you define it? Man. Like, is it is it all of the sweet sweet ducats that you make? Ducats. Is it streaming numbers? Is it downloads? Like, what? How how do you? Yeah. Is there a, a, a fair meter for how you think you're doing? Ooh. No. Um, year to year, I kind of assess things, and I'm like, all right, did I do better? Did I? You know, it's usually. For me, you know, I can I can say, all right, the money I make, or am I comfortable? Am I working extra hard? Am I exhausted <laughs> at the end of every single day? Um, I think success is, I'm going to give you the, the storybook answer that I've been using my whole life, which is doing what you love and loving what you do. That is success. If you absolutely love it, you are successful. And if you're able to pay those bills, that's a bonus. But... Um, as I've learned in the last few years, the meaning of success for me is being able to say no. And not just no, but sometimes hell no. You know, just the, being able to be like, nah, you know. <laughs> not now, for me. I'm, and it's, it's, it's that success for me. Like, if you can turn down, you know, decent, you know, money because you just don't want to do it, that is success. Like, if being able to turn down a gig, especially as a, you know, a gigging musician that's like, uh, self-employed, mm -hmm. I think that's success. Like, being able to not have to do the things you don't want to do. Like, that's really what it comes down to. I'm like, I'd rather play with my two-year-old than go do this thing for a person who hates me and, you know, who, and do a thing that's going to be excruciating. So, now I'm able to weigh those. And now that I have a kid, oh, I'm a new dad, by the way. Hey! <laughs> and, um, Welcome aboard. Thank you. We've, um, my, my wife and I fostered um, a beautiful baby, Aww. and um, that was our that was our pandemic project. I wrote a book, and then we fostered a baby. <laughs> um, we were like, let's try this, you know. Like, aren't you getting tired of looking at me? Let's bring somebody else in the house. Um, so yeah, we we started that journey, and it was it was amazing, you know, first, but um, <laughs> but also <laughs> it was amazing at first, nerve wracking, little... you know, the whole nerve wracking thing of like. Uh, bringing in a baby, you know, as far as like fostering and uh, not knowing if that baby's going to have to go. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the first time we tried it, we had a baby for a few weeks, you know, and they were like, oh, geez, five days, not even a few weeks. Yeah. And so I was on tour. I met him once. And then my wife calls me, you know, hysterical, like we have to send him back. Like, and I was like, oh, my God. So it's it's something that you it takes a really special type of person. And I remember her being like, I can't do this. And I was like, let's not do it. And then we had this long talk later. 
and we realized like maybe that five days was like what we were supposed to do and be there for this guy for like just to get him a little bit of stability so we we're like no matter how long it is if it's a week if it's a month if it's a year like we're doing that kid a service you know so that mentality has to go into fostering so thank you so we'll say anybody who's even on the fence about it like do it because it'll change your life so first they tell us because they let you get all types of choices. They're like, oh, well, what, what age would you like? What race would you like, you know? And you start saying, I want a baby. I don't want no 14-year-old coming in my house, knocking my PlayStation off the, you know, <laughs> table. Like, you ain't my dad, you know? I don't want that. So, you want the after-school special movie version of being a foster yes, parent? Yes, exactly. And if I can choose, yeah, I want that. So I'm like, I want a baby. And they were like, get in line. Everybody wants a cute baby. It's not going to happen. And I'm like, all right, I'm still going to write it down. And they're like, you shouldn't write it down because you're probably not going to get a baby. And we're like, whatever, man. And then we do it. And then a few weeks, maybe a month later, they're like, you're not going to believe this. We got a baby for you. And I'm like, what? He came to us at what, four weeks? Three weeks old, this amazing baby boy. And uh, we were able to adopt him last spring. So it's been beautiful. <clears throat> so are you in the, uh, the poop or chocolate phase? Or you're like, what is that under my Wait, fingernail? Wait, what's that? No. <laughs> is that poop or chocolate? Are we there yet? I don't think we're there chocolate. yet. Chocolate! Uh, <laughs> uh. no. He is obsessed with butts now. He, just, he says butt a lot. And I so, mean, listen, you know. never grows out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Never. 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 Wow, poop or chocolate eggs. <laughs> it's no, usually but poop. hey, one out of every five times is like this fucking chocolate. <laughs> uh, thank you. Wow. Um, I, if anybody has any questions for either of us, I think that oh, yeah. there's a mic that's going to be roving around. Mike's or, coming around. Mike's coming around. Oh, by the so. way, I'm playing a show tonight. What time? Eleven. Yeah, Hello. come through. See a concert, hear me rap about Star Wars and video games and pro wrestling, and it's going to be a lot of fun and it, lots of interactive oh, stuff. <laughs> uh, Mark, you did a cameo for me and uh, give me encouragement about my writing and promoting my writing. Mm -hmm. hey. um, and uh, I was wondering if I could give you a copy of my book. Oh, absolutely. And hey. uh, where did you go to school at? In did you go to school in Pennsylvania? I did. I went to Penn State. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a real. That's a good school. Yeah, that's that's a good one school. of those good schools. Um, it's <coughs> notoriously. I was there at the same time that the Jerry Sandusky stuff was going on, but I didn't realize it. But um, Ooh, dang, that is sweet, outstanding. Thank you. Ooh, I like that. Nice. All right. I got a present. Nothing for you. Nothing for me. Nothing <laughs> for you. <laughs> Anybody um, else want to know a thing from either of us? We got, we got. Uh, oh. Not so much a question as it is a statement. Mega Rand, man, I hey. know a couple of different couples that are uh, foster families. You guys are amazing. I, I, I mean, so uh -huh. much respect to you guys because you put your whole heart in every kid that comes through your doors. And I mean, thank you, thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh man, you absolutely have to. And they tell you like we take a bunch of classes, and they're always like. Oh, uh, you know, you just, the attachment, like, you just gotta, you gotta, like, not get too attached. And I'm like, this is a child. Like, what do you mean? You know, you gotta give your full heart and your full attention and soul to anybody that comes into your home, you know? So you can't half do it, you know what I mean? Whether, like, it's a day or a lifetime, you know? So it takes a special person, for sure. I didn't think I had what it took. It was really my wife. I want to shout my wife out. Hey, baby. I gotta shout her out because without a a partner to go through this with, like I don't think I'd have been able to handle it. I'd have been like, take him back! Ah, this is gross. No, <laughs> you'd have been the the Rafiki on the top of Pride Rock, just throwing fucking yeah, Simba back. Throwing. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Hi, yeah, my name is Shantae, and first hey. I'm gonna tell you guys. Thank you guys, because I'm the only nerd female here, and it's really tough to be a black nerd female. Hey. I'm not going to lie. Black guys have it easy, but females, we can't hide that. <laughs> well, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I feel like, yeah, I had it hard, but women, oh my gosh. Yeah, I it's, can't it's, even it's a little bit different with us. <laughs> yeah, it's a little different. But I do appreciate you guys, and I want you guys to know that that was a really big thing for me, and especially when I was a kid. 
I was always picked on a lot. And even by both sides, mm -hmm. even on the black side and on the other color side. And I never knew where I was going to be at or where I belong. Mm -hmm. And I was always called the nerd or just because I played video games and just talk nerdy and like comic books and play Yu-Gi-Oh cards and mm -hmm. all that stuff. But you guys were there to help out, and I really appreciate that, and especially with the foster. Mm. Um, two years ago, my husband and I found out that we were not able to have kids. As a matter mm. of fact, they took my left tube out, and we went to go try to have a child. They told me I only had 5%, and that was the toughest thing for us. So when you said about adoption, that meant a lot to me because when the doctor was talking to us, I couldn't just see myself being pregnant and I'm seeing kids here on this world that needs love. Yes. And that was one of those things that took back from me when I went. So thank you for all that mm. support because we needed to hear that. Aww. And that was really good. So thank you. Aww. Thank you so much. Great. Shout out to all the black girl nerds out there. You are home. You're home. Yes. <laughs> Where were you when I was 13 years old? <laughs> right? <laughs> It was it was fucking scarce out there. No, for real. Um, I I really enjoy watching your show while I'm doing my work, and I I also sewed something for you if I could give it to you. Sure. Hey. I got a big box here now for stuff. Somebody You're gonna invited... be like a katamari ball by the end of this. You're gonna have so much stuff stuck Somebody to you. Somebody invited me to a wedding today. <laughs> what? <gasps> oh. oh my gosh. What? Very, you made these? Oh, that's so cool. Look at that. It goes right I on the track. I it was a bracelet, because that's it's, awesome. I mean, it could be a bracelet, too. Yeah, it's so a Star Wars koozie. Yeah. Thank you. Cool no, oh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, that's dope. So, I'm a fan of hip-hop, and I've been noticing a lot more nerd references in, in songs. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Like, Denzel Curry, even what Kanye West sampling Jay. How Yo. do you feel about those new references? Like, you, you Man. Feel like, Man, I could have done that. Man, I love it. I, I had a um I remember there was a rumor a long time ago before Kanye went Kanye, um, that he was that he was gonna name his album like TurboGrafx sixteen. And I was like, if he does that, I'm gonna say that he bit that for me, <laughs> you know. But um oh, yeah. But no, it's it's really cool to see. Like I love it because we were we were such outcasts, you know, when we did it. But now, like being able to see the world kind of open up for for people to be their true selves. Like people are mentioning wrestling, they're mentioning video games, comic books, Jay, like sampling Jay, like that's amazing. So we're in a. I, this is a world that I wanted to see, a world that I never thought we'd see. So I think it's dope. Like I love it. Yeah, like um, imagine that. Like we're we're now like we don't have to be so afraid of that. Like I used to have video game magazines and read them in school, but I would put Sports Illustrated on front of it because I just didn't want the, the bullies to be like, "What are you doing over there, nerd?" You know, like ah, touchdowns and things. You know, and, uh, <laughs> sports ball, sports ball. You know. Um, <laughs> But I love that we're in a world now where I can be just as nerdy about sports or things like that as I am about video games, comic books, you know, the the USQ universe as as, as well. And uh, yeah, it's just a great world. Like I I wish I had this world when I grew up, but like we had to kind of fight for it. And like now I, mean, I you, appreciate you it. helped build it, right? We helped it's build like, it. Yes, we built this city. We built this, this city. city on nerds and dumb shit. You're gonna pay for that sample, by the way. <laughs> I did, I, it was a dramatic reading, not a performance. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. He doesn't pay. <laughs> All right. Question. Uh, what's your opinion on the movie Dope and the newest House Party movie? Um, hmm. Okay. All right. The newest House Party movie. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't feeling it, but it also wasn't for me. You know, like, I've, I've gotten to the, to the point in my life where I realized that, like, I remember seeing all of the Twilight movies, like all of them. And they're not great, but they're also not for me. It, it wasn't speaking to me. Right. Those movies you know, are written from the perspective of the incredibly thoroughly average 15, 16-year-old girl 
who is somehow so amazing that she draws the attention of 600-year-old vampires <laughs> and werewolves. Like, it's not my wish that's being fulfilled, and I'm fine with that. Yes. You know, and so, but it exists, and that's a wish that people have, and so they should 100% get to see and feel as good as I get to see and feel when I see Into the Spider-Verse, or when I see Black Panther, or when I yeah. see, when I watch Aliens, or Road Warrior, or any of the things that I'm spilling water on myself about. Hey. Um, but like, so fine, it's okay, house party's not for me. I am not a 17-year-old black kid anymore. That other house party was for me when I was that kid. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, and so, and like, dope. I kind of fucking dug dope. Like, I like dope. You, like, I thought, I thought it was great. It's a strong, strong movie, and it's, it's the kind of movie that I wish you could make that didn't have to have drugs attached to it. Like, dope could have also been Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. Right? Like, just mm. a bunch of fucking brown kids having a day, and weird shit happens. It mm. also happened. Why he's also gonna have a bag full of dope? All right. I suppose that's how you get that money for a movie about a bunch of black kids. Yeah. But. I think that there's there's an audience for almost everything, except for Madam Web. <laughs> <laughs> isn't I mean in it in its terribleness like isn't that it, in itself an audience like don't don't you want to see something terrible like you know what I, I mean, mean like there's that I'm gonna get into it on Fat Man Beyond on right. Sunday I'm looking forward but to it. <laughs> like that is it feels to me like that's what they're trying to generate out of a movie that's awful yeah it's like look you have to see how bad it is it's like the, cats the sharknadoes the, the, the cats thing you know yeah. it's like look at how bad but cats like at least cats was weird cats got a is question like, cats is like oh hey there's fucking Idris Elba why is Idris Elba here <laughs> why is like Rebel Wilson plays a cat who unzips her cat skin and wearing other cat skin underneath it what is happening what? here why but also, like, half those songs are bangers. There's no bangers at all in Madam Web. Anyway. <laughs> Question. Hello. Hi. Hey. Um, were there any famous people that you found out were fans of yours that you were shocked by? Ooh. Okay. My favorite story is uh, Cisco from Drew Hill, the, uh, the singer. From Drew Hill. From the thong song. Thong song <laughs> Cisco. The I greatest should've... song ever written. <laughs> I, I guess I should have known, like with the platinum hair and like the dragon imagery and stuff. But um, man, he is one of us. I'm just being so serious. His son's name is Ryu from Street Fighter. Damn. Um, and so I only know that because I'm walking around E3, and uh, and I see him getting interviewed, and I was just like, oh, that's interesting. Let me just take a picture of Cisco being interviewed, and he stops his interview like, yo. Mega Ran, hold up, hold up, that's Mega Ran. And like, he's like, turn the camera on him. And I'm like, no, don't. I'm like eating a pretzel, like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> and he's like, no, turn the camera, that's Mega, oh my God. Mega Ran, man, me and your kid, me and my kids listen to your stuff all the time, like while he's on camera. And I'm like, what? And he's like, come here and say something to the people. And I'm like, that's Cisco, y'all. <laughs> like, that's all I can say. And uh, he's like, oh my God. And now like, we, we text about video games. Like he's a huge Zelda fan and like, so uh, what happened? We have really hilarious conversations. So he's like, dude, have you played the new Zelda? And I was like, man, I'm real busy, but I'm going to get to it. Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate. And he's like, ah, oh, no, that Zelda, that Zelda. And I was like, I'm going to get to it, man. I got to buy it. He's like, you didn't even buy it yet? And I'm like, nah, man, I'll get to it. And he's like, mm, you're new. And he's like really angry. And he sends dragon emojis. And it, yeah. Of course he does. He does. And so I'm seeing like dragon emojis pop up like he's really angry. And, and I'm like, I'm gonna get to it, man. And he's like, you know what? I'm tired of this. And I was like, what? Like, are we not friends anymore? And he's like, and he sends me like a code to download it for free. <laughs> like, he's like, no, no, you need to get this game right now. And he sends me like a Nintendo download code for the game. It's like, all right, man. Like, I'm gonna play it. So now, like, if I talk to him, I have to update him on my Zelda progress. Like, he, I'm like scared now because, like, I gotta. Like, you didn't get out of the first dungeon, man. You know. So yeah, he's just he's a super nerd. So like. Being able to like text with him is just insane. Like he gets my wife tickets for shows when they come through, and and I'm just like, wait, what is my life? You know, like it's it's strange things like that. That or wrestlers coming up to me, being like, oh man, I love your stuff, and I'm like, wait, how? You know, like so that's that's amazing. What's your biggest like celebrity story of somebody being a fan? Um, the 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 oddest one was, and it's not even that odd, I guess, but I don't know. It fucking tickled the shit out of me. I was, a, I was working on a show called Eyes of Wakanda, mm. which is not out yet. It's an animated series for Marvel. Um, they just announced it, I think, like a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
But so we're in this room. We've been in the room. It was like one of my pandemic gigs, my lockdown jobs. Mm -hmm. So everything was over Zoom. And then one morning on the Zoom, fucking Ryan Coogler pops up on the Zoom. Like in one of the box. Just boom, and it's Ryan. And like we're all a little flustered. And he starts like, oh, hey, man, it's me. It's Ryan, whatever. I'm in, I'm in production on Black Panther 2. I just wanted to, to just stop in and tell you all how proud I am of the show and whatever. He's like, oh, hey, Mark, I really dig Fat Man Beyond. I listen to that a lot. I was like... <laughs> Shut up, Ryan. Don't you even know. No. Oh, man. I like, I'm just I'm die. like sucking the tear back into my eye. And, <laughs> like, and Mark has left the chat. Boop. Like, yeah. <laughs> just be like, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta go. Right, I think we got time for one more question. Uh, two years from now, are you more excited about uh, James Gunn's Superman or Marvel's Fantastic Four? Ooh. Ooh. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I've been waiting for a it's new a good Superman Pascal. for a really long time. However, Pedro is daddy. So, God, man, I'm a man. I wrote a song about Pedro because I just love him so much. Um, Pedro, Pedro, man's been killing it in a row. We're coming in by the caseload. <laughs> Too hot now, can't lay low. That's Pedro. All right, anyway, I digress. Um, so with that being said, Fantastic Four. I said it. Um, I, I'm more, I believe, I have to believe there's a way to make a good Superman movie. And it, it breaks my heart that we haven't had a good one. Yeah. We haven't had a great one since 1978. Like, yeah, I mean, I said it, like Man of Steel is fine, but it is not like Christopher mm -hmm. Reeve in fucking Superman the movie yeah. is perfect. Like, and the, the clip always surfaces. It's, it's around on the internet all the time of him taking his glasses off for that first time. Mm. And you just see him, like, his spine stiffens and he lifts. And he just suddenly it's this visual effect that comes yeah. out of nowhere where he gains three inches of space. Yeah. And that's Superman, mm -hmm. right? And so I've been waiting for somebody to figure out how to do that again and realize that Superman does not need to be dark. I don't need him to be quote unquote real. That is not what he's here for. Yeah. He's here to A, be an example, and B, to be a tragedy, you know, and to realize, because I remember Mark Wade explained this to me once, because we were at a convention and we were both drunk, and, uh, and, and we were complaining about the state of the comic book world, and it was like the thing most people don't get about Superman is that he can hear every cry for help all around the world, but he has to choose who he saves, because he can't save everybody. So every night he goes to sleep with the sounds of screams for help echoing in his ears. That's that fucking guy. Ooh. And if you can capture that feeling of the guy who tries so hard but will never be able to complete the race, that's what makes Superman tick. It is not that he's stronger than everybody can fly or, or fucking laser beams out of his eyes, any of that stuff. It's he will never be able to be as good as he wants to be, even though he's, quote unquote, the best. And I keep waiting for some movie to not be afraid to make that what Superman is. I don't know if James Gunn is that guy. I don't know if that cast is that guy. But I always live in hope that every time a Superman movie comes on the pike that somebody remembers how to write that character and remembers that he doesn't have to be bitter. He doesn't have to be dark. He doesn't have to be tortured by anything other than the fact that he can't be everywhere all at once. Hmm. So I love 60s Fantastic Four. I'm here for Pascal. I'm here for Vanessa Kirby. I love Vanessa Kirby. Yeah. Um, and I'm 100% here for fucking, you know, Eben from The Bear yeah. as, as an actual Jewish Ben Grimm. Like, bring me that shit all day. Yeah. Um, but there's, I keep waiting for somebody to crack that Superman nut. Um, and then they can have all the nuts. So, mm. And with that, boys and girls... That is an episode of Black Man Beyond. Have you had a good time tonight? If you have, go see him performing later tonight. And again, when? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday is the kids show. I'm doing that one with all the my kids new show. kids jams. Outstanding. Uh, tomorrow, I am screening Splinter, a short that some of you may or may not have helped me make. Uh, that's tomorrow at 10 p.m. I think the Starlight Theater, maybe. I don't know what the venues are named here yet. Um, <laughs> But that's 10 o'clock tomorrow, and then Kevin and I do Fat Man Beyond on Sunday. After you've maybe spent all of your money on the shore excursions and maybe not been eaten by sharks or um, <laughs> molested by crazy roving islanders. I don't know what happens in the Bahamas. Um, but come see him. Come see me. Come see us. Have a good-ass time. We're, we're on a boat, motherfuckers. 
Let's a ship. They they corrected me several times today. It's a ship. Ships nah. carry boats. We're, according to T Pain, we're on a boat. I'm um, on a boat. So yes, thank you and good night. Thank you. Nah, 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 nah. See you tonight. Peace. Sometimes the truth isn't good enough, you know. Sometimes people deserve more. Sometimes people deserve to have their faith rewarded. So it's time to go beyond. It's time. Black man, going beyond all the time. Tell your friends, tell your mom that this pod is the bomb. It's the black man, yep, the star of the show. Staying humble, but sometimes you just gotta let them know. It's the black man, oh yes, the black man. Synchronized swatches, time to get it started. And whether you get it weekly or you wait for the trades, it's the equivalent of Mega Brand taking the stage. You've been waiting for days for your pop culture fix. Now a new episode is on your six. We in the mix, bringing in guests, keeping it fresh on the never ending quest. Nerding out without a doubt. Now you know who is the best for your hot takes and deep dives on Mark. You can read live, hit them up on Twitter. You might even get a reply. Flash the back. If you ever need a hand and summon the best geek podcast in the land, I'm talking black man. Now send this out to each hood, live long and prosper. I got you, now be good. It's the black man going beyond all the time. Tell your friends, tell your mom that this pod is the bomb. It's the black man, yep, the star of the show. Staying humble, but sometimes you just gotta let them know. It's the